How St. Joseph the Hesychast Conquered the Demon of Fornication Excerpt from My Elder Joseph the Hesychast by Elder Ephraim of Philotheo in Arizona Chapter 4 With Elder Ephraim the Barrel Maker Note In the following passage, Francis is the future St. Joseph the Hesychast. After Francis had been on Mount Athos for two or three years and had been with Father Arsenios for about a year, the wise elder Daniel of Katunakia said to them, You aren't accomplishing anything like this. Now you will listen to me. Here on the Holy Mountain there is a tradition. In order to become an elder, you need to bury an elder. In other words, you need to have an elder and be obedient to him until his death in order to become an elder. The two of you, however, will not succeed because you are living idiorhythmically. You, pointing to Father Arsenios, have left from your place of obedience, and you, pointing to Francis, have not become a great schema monk yet. Without the blessing of an elder, nothing succeeds in monasticism. Without the seal of a spiritual father, no spiritual work bears fruit. If you want to have the grace of God all your life, you must first pass under obedience. But where can we go? asked Francis. Don't worry, my children, Elder Daniel continued. I see the calling you have for prayer. Nearby in our neighborhood, at the cell of the Annunciation, there are two little old monks, Ephraim and Joseph. They won't live very long, five or ten years at most. Indeed, they would only live for another seven years. If you receive their blessing, then you are free to continue struggling as you please. Then you can do whatever you want. So go and be obedient to them and take care of them in their old age. And when they die, you, Francis, will become a normal elder. Since both of them were full of zeal to do the will of God, they followed his advice without hesitation. In fact, they considered it to be a real revelation, as if it had come straight from the mouth of God. So they went and submitted themselves in obedience to the little old monks, Joseph and Ephraim the barrel maker. The elders Ephraim and Joseph were simple, good, and guileless old men. They were from northern Epirus, and they lived together in Katunakia in the cell of the Annunciation, a little lower down from Elder Daniel. When Elder Ephraim was a layman, he married and had eight children. He lived with great piety and gradually began to desire the monastic life. His wife, however, did not want to let him leave, so he prayed fervently that God would find a way for him to become a monk. It was not long before his children started dying one by one. As soon as his wife realized what was happening, she said with trembling, Quickly get up and go become a monk, so that at least one or two of my children will survive and be around to console me. Without waiting for her to change her mind, he seized the opportunity and immediately went to Katunakia and became a monk alongside his relative who was already there, Father Joseph. They were disciples of Father Nicodemus of Dionysio, who was a learned writer and hesychast, and had built the cell of the Annunciation at Katunakia. An example of their asceticism and their simplicity is the following story. Once, when Elder Ephraim was bringing dinner to his elder Joseph, he dropped the pot on the ground. The pot broke and the pasta in it scattered all over the ground. When he told his elder what had happened, he replied with simplicity and forbearance, Eh, then we'll just eat it there. And so they did in fact eat their pasta right off the ground. Francis and Father Arsenios went to these blessed old monks at the end of 1923. Elder Ephraim didn't know how to express his joy for the obedience and assistance of his two new disciples. He was frequently moved to tears seeing their eagerness and their perfect obedience. With all his might, Francis dedicated himself to blessed obedience in order to please his elders. He loved them even more than himself. He didn't treat obedience as a chore, but he served the old monks with a joy that flows from love. For when you truly love someone, you spontaneously do whatever you can to make that person happy. 
Young Francis quickly realized from his own experience that the more reverence one has for one's elder, the more grace one receives. He would constantly teach this great lesson to all who would later come to him for advice. Francis and Father Arsenios behaved like angels towards their elders. They prepared the food, cleaned the house, and did whatever was necessary with joy and love. In fact, They even tried to foresee what the elders would need in order to please them more. They had so much reverence for those old monks that they were even more obedient to them than children are to their real parents. For this is the true meaning of obedience, to remove your ego from the center of your soul and to place God and your elder there. It was not long before they saw the fruits of their obedience. Because of their obedience, it was natural that they found great ease in prayer. In this way, Francis realized from his own experience why the Holy Fathers praised holy obedience. He began to understand what the Holy Fathers meant when they said, A disciple, in the depths of his soul, breathes God and his elder like an innocent baby. Throughout that entire period, he had the gift of tears which ran ceaselessly like a river. His heart was aflame with love for God and his spiritual father. Ever since then, Francis held holy obedience as the foremost virtue. He emphasized no other virtue more than this one. In fact, he later wrote to someone, Personally, I have never seen anything more comforting in my soul than perfect obedience. Under the protection of blessed obedience to elders Ephraim and Joseph, Francis and Father Arsenios began their great struggles. It was during that time that Francis engaged in the most fierce and relentless battle of his monastic life, with the demon of fornication. One night while Francis was saying the prayer with stillness, a light suddenly filled the place, and he came to Theoria. He himself related this vision as follows. My noose was raptured up to a plane. I beheld monks there lined up for battle according to rank. A tall general approached me and said, Do you want to enter and fight in the front line? And I answered that I greatly desire to duel with the Ethiopians on the other side, who were screaming and breathing fire like wild dogs, and whose mere sight aroused fear. Even so, I was not afraid, because I had so much fury that I could have ripped them apart with my teeth. It is true, though, that even as a layman, I had a very brave soul. So then the general separated me from the lines where there was a multitude of fathers. After we passed three or four lines in the regiment, he brought me to the front line, where there were one or maybe two monks face to face with the ferocious demons. The demons were ready to rush against us, but I was also breathing fire and fury against them. He left me there and added, I shall not hinder, but shall help whoever desires to fight bravely against them. Then I came to myself once more and reflected, I wonder, what kind of war is this going to be? From then on, fierce carnal warfare began, in which the demons did not let him have a moment's rest, day or night. Every night was a ferocious battle, and every day was full of thoughts and passions. He couldn't get any sleep because every time he closed his eyes and began to sleep, the warfare intensified. He slept standing up in a corner or sitting in a special wooden stool with armrests that he himself had made. He passed eight entire years without lying down for sleep, that is, as long as it took for the carnal warfare to pass. It is worth emphasizing that he had never had any past experience with carnal sins and was completely chaste. Nevertheless, God allowed this warfare to be intense, not only so that he could show his good intentions, but also so that he would later be able to guide others to the fragrant pastures of chastity. He would pray with tears and agony of heart, My dear Panagia, I want complete purity and virginity. I don't want this sinful pleasure, my dear lady. Francis struggled intensely because he was completely aware of what was happening. Besides, it was in his character never to give in to anything improper. He fasted strictly, 
and kept vigil all night. He only partook of dry bread and water. When he would reach the limits of exhaustion, grace would strengthen him, and thus he would continue his fearsome struggle. The more time passed, the tougher the demon's warfare became. It was nearly incessant. But he, too, was full of rage against them. He was so courageous that he said to the demons, Either I'll devour you, or you'll devour me. This is why he never lost a single battle against the demons. With such dedication to fight till death, how could the grace of God not help him and raise him to lofty spiritual states? Every evening he sat down and prayed noetically for six hours without letting his noose leave his heart. He synchronized the invocation of Christ's name with his breathing. The pangs of death have encompassed me. The perils of Hades have found me. In fact, he strained himself so much that his sweat ran as if from a faucet. He had a cane for hitting himself and his calves, and especially on his thighs. He beat himself mercilessly two or three times daily, which left permanent indentations on his thighs. He later wrote, I broke many canes on my thighs before subjugating my body. I stood like a torturer over myself. My whole body trembled when it saw that I was about to lay hold of a cane. The demons fled. The passions were pacified. Comfort came and my soul rejoiced, for it is a law of God. Whatever causes sensual pleasure is cured by pain. He continued begging God to have pity on him and to remove the warfare from him, but the assaults continued. It is very likely that contemporary monastics and struggling laymen will wonder why this young ascetic beat himself so mercilessly. Even though it sounds horrible, it is not a sign of mental instability, nor is it the only such instance in ascetical literature. God has revealed through various miracles that he accepted this form of ascesis as a martyrdom. The sayings of the Desert Fathers and the latter are full of similar ascetical struggles in which the body is not being punished, but rather being subdued to the ruling noose. The aim of orthodox asceticism is to kill the passions, not the body. Even though Francis was living under obedience with prayer, tears, and ascesis, these harsh attacks continued unabated. It was during this period in his life that he encountered intense afflictions and bitter temptations which were necessary for him to be purified of his passions. He wept, he sighed, he implored the most holy Theotokos, who frequently comforted him, but no solution was in sight. Occasionally the warfare would subside, and he would have a brief respite, and then it would return with even more intensity. His body began to collapse under the pressure of the struggle, and his courage began to waver as he perceived an apparent impasse. Thus, the young spiritual athlete began to lose courage. Sorrow and despair began to envelop him. At this time, God granted him a vision to console him. It was near St. Basil's, on a summer's night with a full moon. His heart was heavy, and grace was providing him with no comfort. He was falling into despair because he had no one who could listen to his pain, and therefore he kept it all bottled up inside himself. Since he had no other way to find relief, he decided to visit his spiritual father, Elder Daniel the Hezekast, so that he could at least tell him his thoughts and receive communion. And then the following happened, as he himself would later write to a spiritual daughter of his. After arriving, I stood a short distance away on top of a rock so that I would not disturb their vigil of noetic prayer. It must have been ten o'clock at night. As I was sitting and saying the prayer noetically, I heard the sweet voice of a bird singing, and my noose was raptured by the voice. I followed it to see where that bird was, carefully looking here and there. As I was searching, I entered a beautiful meadow and proceeded on a road as white as snow with diamond and crystalline walls. Inside the walls were all kinds of golden-hued flowers. So my noose forgot about the bird and was entirely captivated beholding that paradise. As I went farther, 
I saw a tall, splendid palace, amazing both noose and intellect. In the door stood our Panagia, carrying our sweetest Jesus as an infant in her arms. She was all white as snow and glittered, and I approached and kissed her with infinite love. And she embraced me like an infant and said something to me. I cannot forget the love she showed to me as a true mother. Then, without fear or shyness, I went up to her, just as I would approach her icon, and did what a small and innocent child would do when he sees his sweet mother. I still do not know how I left her side, for my noose had been entirely engulfed from above. I departed from there on another road and came back to the meadow where there was a beautiful mansion. There they gave me something as a blessing and told me, Here is the bosom of Abraham. It is customary for us to give a blessing to anyone who passes by here. So I passed by there as well and came to myself, and I was leaning against the rock once again. After this I abandoned the purpose for which I had gone and went down full of joy to venerate the icon of the Panagia in the cave of St. Athanasius the Athenite, because I had great reverence for her. I stayed there six months in the beginning out of love for her and used to light her oil lamp. Night and day I meditated on her. So while I was wholly captive that night by divine love, I went down to thank her. And as soon as I went inside and venerated her, I was standing across from her icon and was thanking her. So much fragrance, like a refreshing breath of air, emanated from her sweet mouth that it filled my soul, and I remained speechless in a second ecstasy for a long time. And when the chapel's caretaker came up to attend to the oil lamps, I fled as if I were delirious, just in case he perceived something and started asking me questions. Later, when he related these visions to us, we asked him, Yerinda, what work did you do so that the Panagia would appear to you and embrace you? And he replied, Through self-reproach and self-knowledge I have realized my wretchedness. What are you? I asked myself. Nothing. You aren't even a worm. When grace comes to a man, it makes him God. But when it departs from him, then he is ready to fall into every heresy every delusion, every moral deviation, and even damnation. Everything is supported by the grace of God, but grace also has its requirements before it will dwell in man. It seeks his good intentions, his willpower, and his struggle. Together with grace, man becomes an angel. Without grace, he deviates and becomes a demon. Because he pondered on such thoughts for hours every day, they became second nature to him. Knowing himself so deeply gave him the humility to be capable of receiving lofty gifts from God without becoming prideful about them. He often admitted, If the grace of God leaves me, I will do the worst crimes because we all have the seeds in our souls, both the good and the bad. Whichever prevail as a result of our own volition will take control. How many people there have been who cast out demons and then fell? After this vision, one would expect that the warfare would have ended. On the contrary, the struggle became even tougher. The peace lasted only a few days, and then the carnal warfare returned twice as strong. He consoled himself through tears and prayer, but there were times that the grace of God withdrew, and then the struggle became intolerable. Through prayer and watchfulness over his thoughts, he continuously struggled to keep his news clear. He also constantly beat himself so that the pain would neutralize the carnal pleasure. But the more he prayed, the fiercer the demons became, because they saw that this young ascetic was trying to elude their traps. And as if all this were not enough, the demons constantly whispered to him in his thoughts, You will not accomplish anything. We will crush you. In vain do you struggle. How long will you last? New assaults of unclean thoughts and intense carnal burning assailed him. Again the demons tried to darken his noose with thoughts of despair, telling him, It is impossible to escape from our hands. Yet the young ascetic did not lay down his weapons. He was extremely patient, prayed day and night, 
and did thousands of prostrations. As if this warfare were not enough, the demons physically beat him out of envy. Every night was a real martyrdom. Some would grab his hair, others would grab his feet, his hands, and his beard, which had not grown long yet. Entire battalions of demons rushed at him and tortured him and shouted all together, Choke him! Kill him! And it wasn't just one or two nights, but continued on for eight whole years. In the beginning, like a fierce lion, he fought against the demons as if they were physical entities. He would grab one of the demons and use him like a club to hit the other demons. He would also punch those evil spirits as if they were material entities. Most of the time, however, his punches passed right through the demons as if he were punching the air. As a result, he ended up bruising his hands against the walls. The walls of his cell were destroyed by all the fighting inside. In the end, young Francis learned through his own experience that it is primarily with the name of Christ and the Panagia that the demons are defeated. As soon as they heard him invoke the name of Christ and the Panagia with love and hope, their might dissipated like smoke. Hurry, my dear Panagia, he would cry from the depths of his heart. He felt his prayers coming out of his mouth like flames while he continued punching them. Immediately the demons would leave, shouting, He burned us! He burned us! Even so, his titanic struggle continued every day without waning. Once he told me, one day as I was just sitting there, I began to weep and said, What is this, my dear God? I am barely eating anything and struggling so hard, yet I still can't win. He is going to destroy me. Not even ten minutes passed, and suddenly Satan, that scum, grabbed me by the neck to choke me. Full of rage, I grabbed his side and bit him with my teeth. The bite was so tangible that I felt his hairs touch my lips. I came to myself after biting him, and I sensed such a stench that I couldn't stay in my cell. I leaped out of my cell, and it still reeked. Despite these difficulties, he frequently experienced the help of the Most Holy Theotokos during his bloody fights and he realized that the Panagia especially loves chastity. This is why he fought against the carnal passion more than any other passion. He wrote, I cannot describe to you how much our Panagia loves chastity and purity. Since she is the only pure virgin, she wants and loves everyone to be pure like that. To make things worse, the other monks called Francis deluded and avoided him because they lacked experience of such supernatural struggles. After almost eight years of ceaseless and intense carnal warfare, by then his elder Frem had already made Francis a great schema monk with the name Joseph. On the last day when Christ was about to deliver him, he was pondering in despair. Since my body has broken down as if completely dead, and since my passions are active as if I were perfectly healthy, the demons have won. Surely they have burned and defeated me, instead of my beating them. And then he was finally delivered from this warfare in the following way, as he himself described later. As I was sitting there wounded, despairing, and virtually dead, I perceived that the door opened, and someone entered. I did not turn to see who it was, though, but kept saying the prayer. Suddenly I felt that beneath me someone was stimulating me towards sensual pleasure. I turned and saw the scurvy demon whose wounded head stank. Then, like a wild beast, I dashed to grab him. However, as soon as I grabbed him, he had hairs like a pig. He disappeared. He left the sensation of his hairs on my fingers and the smell of his stench in my nose. At last... From that moment on, the war ended. All the turmoil ceased. Peace came to my soul, and I was completely freed from the filthy passions of the flesh. All night long he thanked God, who had not forgotten him. He jubilantly chanted the ode that the prophet Moses sang when Pharaoh was defeated. Horse and rider hath he hurled into the sea. In the morning, tired from his long vigil, 
he went into ecstasy and had the following vision, as he himself related. I saw a spacious place that was separated by a sea. In this spacious place, traps were strewn everywhere, but they were hidden so that they would not show. I was in a place very high up, and I saw everything as if in a theater. All the monks had to pass through this area. And in this sea was an enraged dragon, a horrifying demon, whose eyes emitted flames. He would stick out his head to see if the monks were getting caught in the traps. As they passed by without fear or caution, one was caught by the neck, another by the waist, another one by the foot, another by the hand. And seeing this, the demon laughed with delight and exultation. But I was greatly distressed and cried, Oh, evil demon, the things you do to us and how you deceive us. Then he came to himself with both joy and grief. Joy because he had seen the snares of the devil. Grief because he perceived the dangers that we face our entire lives. After this final victory of his, he admitted to one of his spiritual children, I was given the gift of purity, the gift of not differentiating between women and men. The passion is not roused within me at all. By the Lord's grace, I received the gift of purity in full knowledge of what I was receiving. Through his indomitable determination, Father Joseph attained this lofty state, even though he had not yet reached the age of 32. From his own experience, he was able to teach his spiritual children. When a person struggles to keep his body pure and his noose chased from filthy thoughts, his life and his prayer ascend like fragrant incense to the heavens. I have seen in practice what I am telling you. There is no sacrifice to God more fragrant than chastity of the body which is obtained with a bloody and dreadful struggle. I have much to say about this blessed chastity, the fruit of which I have tasted and eaten. But you are not able to bear now what I would say. Only one thing shall I tell you now. When such people change their underclothes, which happens every three to six months, they give off a fragrance that spreads throughout the entire house as if a refreshing vial of myrrh had been opened. This is a sign from God of blessed chastity and their most holy virginity. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Most holy Theotokos, save us.